So we're going to start out. Tim Raditz is the, the next speaker, also with uh, Wisconsin Discovery Farms, but he also does work with Minnesota Discovery Farms as well. And he'll talk a little bit more about that after lunch, but I'll turn it over to Tim. I can get. Can everybody hear me back there? Okay, not that great. Testing, testing. Is that better? All right, good. Well, as Ron said, my name's Tim Raditz. I am your second part of the Raditz Entertainment <coughs> Hour. Uh, so Amber spoke before. Uh, no relation between the two of us, but uh, <laughs> we know each other pretty well. Um, I work for the Discovery Farms programs in Minnesota and Wisconsin, so I split my time 50-50 between the two states. Uh, this works out pretty good because when I'm in Minnesota I can say I'm a Viking fan and when I'm in uh, Wisconsin I can say I'm a Packer fan. I'm everybody's best friend that way. But the, today I'll be talking about data that was part of my research thesis at uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, where we we're looking at soil, mo soil moisture and its impact on non-frozen ground runoff. And I should say the idea behind this uh, came from the farmer that we were actually collecting data on. I, I can't claim this idea as my own. We started collecting data on his farm and with that data set we collect runoff and precipitation and, and humidity, but we also collect soil moisture. And he started looking at that soil moisture data uh, and seeing that it had a large impact on when he could get out in, into the fields. So he started using that soil moisture data set uh, to schedule his field operations. And he's a, a, a no-till direct plant producer, so he was more concerned about the compact, compaction issues with wet soils. But we thought, oh, since he's using this data set, let's see what soil moisture looks like in terms of uh, how it affects our runoff during non-frozen ground periods. So an introduction to our, pro our problem, Amber and Dennis talked about this at length. It's really important for us to identify critical high-risk runoff periods so that we can reduce our environmental risk from surface runoff. Uh, we know that there's a few time periods throughout the year where our risk of surface runoff is great and anything we can do to avoid field operations during those time periods uh, will be better off. So what we're really trying to do is understand key parameters that affect surface runoff during the not frozen ground period. Now if you look at these two pictures on the right here, uh, the top one, I can even tell you that that's a critical runoff period, right? Water is moving off the field into the ditch, it's gone. But down in the bottom here uh, is a picture in the springtime uh, before planting. You can't probably see it very well, but there's little water in the, wa or in the waterway, uh, but the fields look relatively dry. So what's our risk during that time period? Can we just go out to the field and say, uh, our risk isn't very high during this time period? So our objectives of the study were to improve the understanding of uh, factors that influence runoff generation <coughs> in agricultural areas, specifically during the non-frozen ground period. So uh, we were specifically looking at two factors, soil moisture and rainfall intensity, and trying to determine if there's critical thresholds where we saw the runoff response of our, our monitored basins change. So if soil moisture got to a certain level, did we see a lot more runoff? or did the runoff response to these watersheds change? <coughs> and similarly with uh, rainfall intensity, uh, was there a point where we got so intense rainfall uh, that the runoff response of these basins changed? So kind of the two, two farms we're looking at, our first is a discovery farm in, in Lafayette County, Wisconsin. Uh, this is part of our uh, discovery farms program, Mark and, and Jan Rickards farm. Uh, we were monitoring at three basins at this farm, and I apologize, all this data is in, in metric units. I haven't switched it over to, to U.S. units, so if you need conversion help, just stop me and ask me. But uh, we were monitoring at three basins runoff, and then at this star here, we had a weather station where we're collecting all our precipitation and soil moisture data. And this farm, a uh, three-year crop rotation of corn, corn, soybeans, and a big part of this farming operation was the direct plant tillage. Uh, we don't even call it no-till because uh, Mark doesn't want us to describe his operation as no-till because <coughs> the word till is involved in that. So direct plant um, 
system. Uh, grass waterways, broad-based terrace, terraces, and tamous soil series uh, mean slopes of around 5%. Our second farm would be the Pioneer Platteville farm, uh, which is the UW uh, Platteville research farm. Similar setup, three basins with a weather station, and they're a little different cropping rotation, a little different tillage, but similar soils and uh, similar slopes. Uh, so conventional tillage, fall chisel plow, followed by a, a soil finisher in the spring to prepare the seed bed. And the surface residues uh, were around 15 to 30 percent at planting compared with the discovery farms where that was around 55 to 60 percent. So quite a bit lower residue type of farming system. And how we were looking at this, uh, we were using storm event data. So we're looking at storm events during the non-frozen ground period. Uh, and for each storm event, we had a data point. So these data include precipitation depth, intensity, runoff depth from each basin, and a seen soil moisture and crop cover. So even if we had zero runoff, we considered that a data point. And we were only looking at storm events greater than 2.5 millimeters, which is greater than a tenth of an inch. And then again, non-frozen ground periods only from 2004 to 2007. So if we look at the runoff characteristics between these two farms, uh, looking at the study period runoff over those three or four years, we saw a lower number of runoff events and lower amount of runoff depth at the Discovery Farm site. So if you look at the chart on the right here, the top graph would be our runoff events, just number of runoff events during the non-frozen ground period. The bottom would be our runoff depth in millimeters uh, during that entire study period during the non-frozen ground period. The black bars would be our three Discovery Farms basins. The, the hash bars would be our three Pioneer Farms basins. And you can see there's more runoff events, uh, greater runoff depth at our, in general, at our Pioneer Farm location compared to our Discovery Farm location. In fact, if we look at percentage, percentage of precipitation that was leaving these fields as surface runoff during the study period, we're at 0.9% at the Discovery Farm compared to 2% at the Pioneer Farm. So about double the amount of runoff. Um, and between the two farms, like I said, we had similar precipitation. I should have said this Pioneer Farm was very close in location uh, to the <coughs> Discovery Farm, about six miles apart. So they were receiving similar storm, uh, similar storm, similar, similar precipitation characteristics during the study period. The main difference was the difference in tillage systems and in cropping rotations. Now the Pioneer Farm had a cropping rotation that in included alfalfa, so we would expect more soil coverage, uh, lower runoff depths because of that uh, alfalfa in the crop rotation. However, we were seeing just the opposite, and, and we think that uh, the main cause of that is the tillage system employed at the, that Discovery Farm's uh, location that direct plant tillage uh, really increased the soil structure, increased infiltration capacity, um, and increased uh, hydraulic conductivity at that site. Also notice that the basin uh, PF7 did have some impervious surfaces from the farmstead uh, that were draining towards that uh, monitoring station. Notice the number of runoff events from that basin. Uh, we expect, or we think that a large percentage of those runoff events were due to that uh, small amount of impervious surface in, inside that basin. So how we were trying to assess this uh, threshold impacts of soil moisture was using a breakpoint regression analysis and we were plotting the data up, uh, the graph to the right here, of runoff coefficients, which would be our runoff depth divided by the precipitation, and then plotted against antecedent soil moisture conditions. So the way this breakpoint regression works is we fit two regressions to the data set uh, split by a breakpoint and we can vary that breakpoint across the antecedent soil moisture levels. And uh, we set the breakpoint where our lowest combined standard error between the two regressions uh, is met. So an example, we can move it like that. We get to the point where our lowest standard error is achieved, and that's where we determine to set our breakpoint. 
So these were the results of our soil moisture breakpoint analysis. Uh, again, the, the graphs to the right here, runoff coefficient uh, plotted against aniseed and soil moisture for our three basins at the Discovery Farms location and our three bases at the Pioneer Farm location. And you can see just looking at the data visually, uh, the data changes uh, when we get to a certain spot. Uh, the runoff response changes when you look at these types of graphs. In fact, our aniseed and soil moisture threshold for all of our six basins uh, came to be at 0.39 uh, centimeters per centimeter, so 39% volumetric soil moisture which for these soils was about 80% of the porosity. So if you notice, um, above the threshold, our storms contributed 16% of the precipitation, but almost 80% of our runoff, de runoff depth. So a pretty, uh, pretty important, when we get above that threshold, we don't get a whole lot of rain, but we see a whole lot of our runoff depth. Below the threshold, you see a few dots scattered below the threshold. Uh, we did have a few runoff events or, that were from intense storm events. So uh, not a, a totally clean measure of, of runoff prediction. But here is a, a time series of soil moisture at the two farms. So Pioneer Farm would be our dark line uh, and Discovery Farm would be our, our dashed line. And for each year, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007. A lot of data, but the main point here is if we plot up our, our threshold values of 0.39 um, against this time series, we see there's only two time periods during that entire four-year study period where we're at or above that threshold. And that's when we uh, received over 80 to 90 percent of our non-frozen ground runoff during the study period. So we also were looking at uh, rainfall intensity and we marked our I-30 as our rain, rainfall intensity and what I-30 stands for is our maximum rainfall intensity during a 30 minute time period during these storm events. So what we did for this was average, uh, average runoff between the three basins we, so we have a data point for our discovery farms and a data point for our pioneer farm just average the runoff between the three basins. Group our data into three aniseed and soil moisture groups and two crop cover groups. So again, uh, in the next three slides I'm going to show similar graphs. It's a lot of data but the, the point is pretty simil <laughs> simple. And we're graphing runoff coefficient which again is the runoff divided by precipitation versus our I-30 which is our maximum 30 minute rainfall intensity. And at the top here, this is our highest aniseed and soil moisture group. So above 40% soil moisture, volumetric soil moisture. And you can see as our I-30 increases, we have a threshold change um, where it's near zero below the threshold and then increases at a very rapid rate after we get above that threshold. Crop cover above 50% on the left here, crop cover below 50% on the right. And the threshold doesn't vary very much um, in terms of crop cover. So crop cover at this high soil moisture category did not have much of an effect on runoff. If we go to an intermediate soil moisture level, so 35 to 40 percent, uh, we can see that there was a threshold for the crop cover below 50 percent, but when we got above 50 percent there was no threshold defined. So crop cover probably has more of, a, of an effect in that intermediate soil moisture area. But also notice the threshold for I-30 for runoff generation was higher, 12 millimeters per hour compared to 6 and 9 millimeters per hour in that highest soil moisture category. Now if we go to the low, below 35 percent, uh, we can see our thresholds bump out even further, so 48 millimeters per hour and 33. And crop cover effects are, are sort of similar and I think they would be more similar if we had more data in that far right graph. So in conclusion, uh, the ability to identify high risk periods is vital. Soil moisture can be an in indicator. Thresholds for runoff generation of around 39% is what we found to be the threshold. 
But in theory, we're probably looking at more like 35 to 40. We want to give a range because uh, saying one number is probably not not the right approach when we're trying to trying to talk to other farmers around the state about how this could affect uh, some of their management practices. Above that threshold, very little precipitation, but most of our runoff. And our uh, rainfall intensities were strongly influenced by soil moisture. So as soil moisture increased, I-30 thresholds for, for runoff generation decreased. <clears throat> so what does this mean? <laughs> a lot of data. I was able to get a degree out of it, and we got a paper, and that's all great for us. But what does this mean for real people? Um, it's important to think about moisture levels when planning field operations, whether it's tillage, manure applications, pesticide applications. Um, if we look at these, this picture, and maybe you can't see it very well back there, but it's tractors stuck in the mud. So if we get to that level, it's too late, right? Everybody knows our conditions are high. You probably shouldn't be out in that because you're going to get stuck anyways. So what's the point? But if we look at the picture to the right, we want to get producers to think about planning for these intermediate conditions. Being uh, Maybe our soil moistures are, are kind of in that intermediate level, not to the saturation point, but if a rain forecast is in, in, the, in the mix, uh, it could bump those soil moisture levels up to the critical level. Also, if we're looking at liquid manure application, if we're applying 27,000 gallons of uh, liquid dairy manure, that's about an inch of of moisture. So is that liquid manure application going to bump our soil moisture levels up into the critical level where the next rainfall event could be a very high risk for runoff? So that's what we're trying to get people to think about. Um, it's a lot of data that I explained earlier for a pretty simple concept. So with that, I'd like to take any questions you might have and, and thanks to all the people that helped with, with the study.